All right, so welcome to the third lesson of the Automating GIS Processes course. Uh, we, there's quite a lot of content to cover today, but it's all very interesting. Mm. Uh, so after uh, learning the basics of GeoPandas last week, we will deepen our skills, mainly uh, continuing with GeoPandas and Shapely, uh, the packages that we already know. So today, uh, the main topics are geocoding and then spatial queries. Uh, so we will turn addresses into coordinate points. Um, and then the last part of the lesson will focus on different kind of spatial queries and how can we then join information based on uh, spatial location. So that's the topic for today. Um, and at least a couple of students have uh, been in favor of me talking a bit about uh, some of the approaches that were useful in exercises two and three related to either iterating pandas uh, data frames or then applying functions. So I will quickly uh, walk you through a couple of uh, code snippets. So what I just did in here, um, am I in the correct one? Yes, let's go there. So a little bit of recap related to the basic pandas functionalities that are useful uh, useful for our uh, geopandas uh, tasks as well. So what I have in here, I have pulled my exercise two problem to that most of the students have already completed. So it's not spoiling the fun for anybody. And here we had an input CSV with latitude and longitude points uh, and the task was to uh, create geometries so shapely objects uh, for for each row in a way and then later on we learned how to put those into a geodata frame but this is quite a typical task um, in pandas or geopandas and especially if you just get coordinates as a text file, we then need to process those further in order to efficiently analyze the spatial data. So in this uh, problem two, there's a bunch of modules we are importing. Most importantly, shapely point and then pandas, at least at this point, in order to read in the data from the CSV file. I have it in there. And at this point, I already create kind of the output for the geometries. So a column for the uh, shapely point objects. So always when modifying data, it's good to think what data structure you want for the output. So in this case, I want the same exact data frame, but with an additional column with the shapely points. So I have a slot for that. Uh, in this uh, exercise, the one particular thing was the size of the data. So we have 81,000 rows of data. So that's already quite a lot. So if you do something kind of row by row, that's if the process is slow, it will take time. Um, so maybe the most easy to understand approach to solve this was to write a for loop using this data.iterRows function in pandas. I won't run this cell now, this option one, because it will take I don't remember, maybe even minutes to complete. But this script would go, uh, take the data frame. I'll still print the head to get us oriented. Data.head. So we have this uh, non-spatial data columns and rows with this empty geometry there. And the point is to take this one and this one into a shapely point. So for each row, I could go in there. And then I have the index and the row at each iteration in memory. Uh, then using the information of the index, I can access the kind of output location for my point. So all at index one uh, column geometry using the lock, this could be also at, I think at would be even better in here. And then the row variable is a pandas series, and I can then access values at specific uh, using the labels, which are then the column names from the original data frame, and give those as arguments for the point constru the constructor. And that way, I would, for each row, populate the geometry column with the shapely point object based on the, those two columns. 
So I think that's quite logical. It's easier, easy to follow uh, step by step what happens. So for each row, we do that. But it is very slow and actually not the recommended approach because we want to use Python for being efficient. But of course, also it works. You can run the code, go get a coffee, come back, and you have a nice, nice data frame with shapely points. We can then do the same thing uh, using this lambda function. And I'll do my best to explain it. It's a bit abstract. And you learn it best if you then try different examples and try to apply it yourself. So there, um, the starting point uh, is uh, the whole data frame. So I take the whole data frame. I don't have anything, no functions defined or anything. I only have imported the shapely point constructor. Then I apply. Uh, so I apply a function and here the axis parameter is important. So this means that I apply for each row axis zero, which is the default would be then um, kind of column wise, I would do something. But here I want to do something for each row. And when I do this uh, and use this lambda function, you can go and Google the official definitions. But how I understand this is that using this lambda, we kind of create this variable that lives only uh, during the execution of, of this uh, apply function. Uh, instead of x, I could call it row. It might be more uh, logical. But this x then contains each row in a way, if you would think of it as a for loop doing something on each row, a bit similarly as in the uh, iter rows. Uh, we had the variable row. And then as I have this lambda x, uh, then the dots, I can refer on each row to this uh, latitude and longitude columns using the same syntax. So thinking that this uh, variable contains a pandas series, I can get the longitude value, latitude value. And then this whole thing uh, will return a pandas series that I can then assign as a value to the geometry column. OK, I can run this. Uh, it's rather fast. And maybe to make it more clear, if I quickly take this out, what this returns. So it is indeed a pandas series that has the same length as the original data frame. And then this, I just the whole uh, bunch of values. So the whole whole column I can then assign it all at once to this geometry column. OK. Uh, there's actually this, if you want to see how long it actually takes. So there are different ways, but there's this magic command time it for things uh, that are on one row. It now repeats the thing several times, and it's about 1.3 seconds plus or minus uh, that it takes to run this script. And if you did solve the problem like this, you will uh, notice that it's a significant improvement in terms of computational time to use the to apply a function, be it lambda function, or then uh, we can also define our own function. Maybe it should have a doc string. Uh, something like this. So I have a function. And when writing functions for data frames, the input is you, you should think of the input as one panda series, which is one row of data, same as with the lambda function. Uh, so the first argument is the kind of row of data. Uh, and then you can have additional parameters in there. Mm, and in this example, this is a custom made function to work with our, uh, our input data frame. And inside there, it will take the pandas series and access the value from this label uh, or column header. But in the panda series, it's just the label to indicate the correct place in the series. And then it creates the shapely point and returns one point. And when we apply this function on the whole data frame row wise, so axis one for each row. Uh, and in here, the syntax is that you just give the function name. And then by default, it gives uh, each row of data as the first parameter. So you can run this. Uh, and then the output should be the same 
and time-wise they are quite equal the lambda function or then you if you define this separate function and this time it takes a bit longer time because it repeats it several times so yeah equally as fast and then finally uh, there is this uh, zip function so we forget the pandas um, applications or iterations so i just take the columns create a zipped object and then iterate through that and append uh, the shapely points to a list. Mm, and then I can assign the list as a value to the geometry column. And that's super fast like that. So it's less, well, quicker than the previous approaches. Okay, so I hope this is, isn't confusing. You can see there's different ways of uh, arriving the same uh, solution. Sometimes shorter is better. But then, of course, if you have a very complicated function, you might want to either define it separately or even if you don't have a huge data frame, why not to do it row by row if it's then easier for you to understand what's going on. All right. Uh, I stop here. I'm happy to discuss this even further if you have some questions after class or during Friday exercises. Uh, but I hope this now helps you understand what happened in exercise two. And I think the similar approach was useful also in now this exercise three that is that has the deadline on Thursday. Thank you. OK, so that was that. Let's get started with the lesson uh, of today. There's some technical questions, so I'll tackle those and then we can get started. Mm. But lesson three, and please now launch your uh, CSC notebooks instances. Um, and how can I get the L, L3 to my Git? Maybe you mean how can you get it to the JupyterLab instance? So if you can't see the files, I recommend that you go to the CSC notebooks and launch this light instance. So there might be something funny going on with the uh, lesson notebooks again i apologize i'm trying to fix the script that pulls the um, notebooks in there but i hope by default you should see them in this auto gis notebooks lesson tree folder and maybe i could get another green check mark for those who have managed to find the lesson notebooks because it's better to solve that issue now and more even more importantly if you have a problem you can check the uh, red x mm, aha so on your own computer yes i could quickly share you a link so that's a very good question if you want to follow the lesson on your own computer uh, okay. So we have this repository on GitHub. Uh, for the lesson notebooks, which have these empty cells. So it's in here. Uh, I have just updated it one hour ago. So you can go ahead and clone this repository using Git on your own computer if you want to have the student notebooks on your on your own computer. So I just pasted the link to the chat window. But these, so this repository, each time you launch the CSC notebooks, it uh, clones or pulls the latest changes from this, this repository. Good, good question. Excellent. Uh, all right, so let's go uh, continue with lesson three. There's, well, is it four, four main topics? We will start by geocoding, which is the process of turning addresses into coordinates using some kind of geocoding service. Uh, so we will be using uh, the Nominatim geocoder that's linked to the OpenStreetMap data, which works globally. Uh, and if there's some addresses missing, you could go and edit the data yourself. So we start with um, a short geocoding tutorial uh, that you will also need 
in the exercise this week. And then the rest of the lesson is all about spatial queries. So asking questions about location. Is a point inside a polygon or do two objects touch? Are they, do they intersect? Um, does a polygon contain another polygon or a set of points? So these sorts of spatial relationships that we can then uh, later on use for joining data based on, based on spatial locations. And next week, we will further learn how to then even modify geometries based on these uh, spatial relationships. So the actual uh, kind of overlay analysis will come next week. But today, we already start with this, like um, to discuss about uh, spatial relationships and how to analyze those using GeoPandas and Shapely in the background. And the final section related to spatial queries. Uh, we have a nearest neighbor analysis example. Uh, so as you can see, there's quite a long list of pages under lesson three. I won't go through everything in detail. So these two last sections are optional, um, but they are very interesting. So I recommend that you then read those through and go through the code uh, on your own time if you want. And this week's topics are already such that you could start to think about the final project. I will introduce it hopefully even already next week. But this sort of kind of nearest neighbor analysis or things related to spatial queries um, is an excellent starting point for an analysis that could be used in the final project. Mm, so shortly about the final project, I will provide some uh, readily made topics or if you want to uh, develop your own topic for the final exercise, that's also, also very uh, recommended. All right, so let's finally get uh, started with the programming part of the lesson. Well, after this page, so geocoding is the first topic. Mm. And indeed, it's the process of uh, transforming addresses or place names into coordinates in a specific coordinate reference system, often in VGS84. So these geographic coordinates, and then you can reproject the data according to your needs. Mm. Uh, we will do the geocoding in GeoPandas, but uh, the geocoding functionalities in GeoPandas rely on another uh, library called, called GeoPy. Uh, so you can then read detailed detailed documentation on the GeoPy website about the geocoding that happens uh, happens in uh, in in GeoPandas uh, and maybe one of the main things is that there's like multiple possibilities on what geocoding service to use so of course if we convert addresses to coordinates we need some data or some data database about uh, the locations of the different addresses. So there are services related to Bing Maps, Here Maps, uh, Google, and so on. But the one that we will be using is this Nominatim geocoder that then relies on OpenStreetMap data. Mm. So maybe super quickly, if you go to uh, OpenStreetMap.org, which is the kind of Wikipedia of maps, the free editable online map. And you try to look for some address, let's say something super difficult to write, such as Gustav Hellström in Katu, where I am located at the moment. Mm, so you can see that the searches done here actually come from this OpenStreetMap nominatim. Uh, API, and you can also then go directly to the Nominatim, Nominatim interface. Let's take number two. So here, for example, uh, this geocoder service is able to find uh, the building. This is now, I'm actually in here, but this is uh, the campus library on Gustav Hellström, Hellström Street in Kumpula, Finland. 
So there might be, of course, then in these services, it's good to be a bit critical of the results when you get them. For example, in Finland, there's multiple places with Mannerheimintie. So then you should have maybe uh, Helsinki there Oops. to specify uh, the city or even the country and so on. So it's good to not, if you then, now we will be geocoding several addresses all at once using Python. So then good to be critical about the results, put them on a map if there's some, if you get some result from Oulu or uh, from the other side of the world, then you might want to see, see if, for example, this address is missing in the, in the database that you are basing your geocoding on. Okay. Um, great. So you can then if you have some specific geographic area, well, such as Finland, we have also then other services, for example, this DigiTransit uh, that is runs uh, behind these kind of routing services. So the route planner, Reittiopas. So it of course then uses also other data than OpenStreetMap because Finland has such good address databases. Uh, but in this lesson, we will use this nominative geocoder because it's available globally and indeed if if the data is crappy, you can go and make it better. Then there's also geocoding services where you can get a paid plan if you're doing something like building an application that will do many requests. So this nominative um, API is only meant for occasional use. So we don't want to burden, bur burden their services with super many requests. Mm. So you can read more details about the different geocoders and related technical details on these pages. Um, maybe one specific thing related to this nominative interface is that we should specify, sorry for jumping around. Uh, so we should specify this user agent to tell the geocoder who we are. Uh, so if we would have an application, we could put that. But now we will just tell that we are the auto GIS course students and testing things out. OK. Um, yep. So then over at the CSC notebooks, uh, under auto GIS notebooks lesson three, let's start with the first notebook. I'll close this window. And there might last year we spent a lot of time waiting for the requests from the API if that happens. Let's not get stuck in there. Um, but we'll see soon if, if we all are able to get the results. And for that, I will clear the check marks. Mm, just a second. Geocoding. Uh, so we have some input data readily in the instance. Actually, I'll open this again. Notebooks lesson three data. So there is this addresses.txt file. Um, and you can see that there's an ID column. We have maybe 34 addresses. And the file is semicolon delimited because then these addresses have commas. So if we would have a CSV kind of comma delimited file, then the file would break at these points. So here it's actually a good idea to have a semicolon delimited file or a tab delimited or something else. So it's located in the folder data addresses.txt. So let's read that in. Uh, before we can do that, we need to import geopandas as gpd. What else? Uh, from shapely uh, geometry import point. Let's see where we actually need that. And actually, now that we have a, we just have a CSV file, so we want to import pandas as pd, just to read the um, file as a data table from this file path into a variable called data, and then pd read CSV, uh, and then the file path. This should all be familiar to you. Mm. can check check the head oops yep so i already was too fast so now you can see that i actually didn't 
import it properly yet, I need to specify that the separator, so the delimiter is, uh, is it the semicolon or what is that? In English, rerun the cell. So now I have this uh, ID column, well, the index ID column and then the address column nicely in Python. Yep. And then uh, we could check. So check that you read it in so that you have these different columns and then we can check the length of the data. So we have 34 addresses. That's not too much, I would say, uh, for our little test. Tests run in here. Mm, I hope you all were following. So important that the separator is the semicolon to have the data as a pandas data frame. So then to the actual geocoding. Mm, so there is, uh, I'll still open this documentation page from then GeoPandas side. So we want to use this uh, GeoPandas tools geocode, which then calls uh, the GeoPy uh, geocoders. And you can, you can read read the documentation in here. Uh, and I think this is a kind of optional dependency in GeoPandas. In our instance, we have installed it, but then if you get some package error, you might need to install GeoPy separately if you're working on your own computer. Um, to get access to the tool in a kind of efficient way, uh, we can import it like this. So from GeoPandas tools, import geocode. Mm, just test that it works. So I have the installations uh, all set up. And then we have everything ready for the geocoding. We have the input data with addresses on each row uh, in the data frame called data in the column ADDR. Uh, so that's what we want to give us input for the geocoder. And here the syntax is the following. Uh, so, well, first I create an output. So I will get a new geodata frame as an output and calling the geocode uh, function that I just imported. I give as the first parameter the addresses as a panda series. So ADDR, the whole column in there. Then um, Yes, good question. So why do we need to import like this? You could, another uh, example, because we have now gpd, we could call gpd.tools.geocode and do the same thing, but that's more cumbersome to write. So this would then replace re-importing the geocode tool, but it doesn't get imported uh, Let's see if that actually works. Yeah, so that works, yeah. But then it's kind of syntax wise, um, and especially if we would call it several times, this is just easier to then read what's happening. Uh, good, good question though. Um, okay, I continue. So geocode function, I give the addresses, then uh, I give, give the provider. So here, I specify nominatim. We have earlier course materials where we used the Google geocoder, uh, but it has become more complicated and we should all create an account to get an API key and so on and so forth. Um, so let's use this open providers and it's not a capital N, but a small N. Uh, then this user agent parameter. So there you could, for example, say, I'll say auto GIS and my initial initials. Mm, so that will then just get uh, recorded in our request that who is asking for the data. And then uh, this timeout parameter, which then indicates, uh, gives us a bit more time to wait for the request. So let's see now what happens. Mm, it, it, it takes a few moments, but it shouldn't take like 
minutes, but now that we are uh, many users doing this at the same time, it might also then fail for some of us, but let's not panic if everybody doesn't get a result from the API. Mm, yes, I think I got a timeout error. Let's see. Max retries. Yep. So if some of you got the results, we probably should redesign this lesson so that we, we don't run into this type of troubles. But if you did uh, manage to get a result, you could click on the uh, green button. So I suspect that some of you managed to do it quicker than I did. Uh, and then some of you didn't. But this is just to show that then there's this rate limiting in the services. And if we're too many, if there's too many of us doing this request at the same time, kind of from the same, uh, same computer, so the CSC notebooks environment, then it might, might fail, but then let's not panic. I, I just now increased the timeout limit to allow for a bit more, bit more time to get the request. Okay, mine went true. Uh, so you could do the same thing as I did, maybe wait a little bit, increase the timeout. Uh, if you don't manage to get the results now, no panic because I have then the intermediate output that we need from this, uh, this lesson. Uh, you can then find it in the data folder, but let's wait a little bit um, to see how things are going. So if you, get the response please click on the green check mark if you don't get it after a couple of tries go put the red x but i'm sure that when you you are then doing the exercise at different times there should be no problem with asking for 30 addresses i think it's like 50 50 50 at the moment some of some of you have managed and some of you haven't. Mm. So the output that we get from there uh, will have, as we call it like this, so we will get a geometry column, so shapely point objects, and then an address column. Mm, and we'll see soon what this address column actually then means. Uh, so I will now explain the rest of the lesson uh, in here. If you didn't get the result from here and you have double checked the, if you get this kind of timeout error or some request error, uh, don't worry about it. You can maybe follow the rest of this notebook as I explain here and then jump jump along uh, in a in a moment. Mm. Yep. So take the first rows mm, and there's a bit of extra information on how to kind of make uh, make the request take a bit longer so this is from the GeoPy documentation so if you want you can also then test this uh, longer syntax for uh, making the geocoding request with a delay if, if you like but I such, suggest that if you didn't get the response, uh, you just follow follow now and listen to the next next couple of steps. So this this will uh, not take too long to go through the rest of the notebook. Uh, so now that we have this kind of output, then from the geocoder, we have the geometry and the address. We have actually lost the original information. So we had this ID column and then the original address that we had, and we might then want to bring these two together. Uh, there's different ways of doing that, but it's an excellent opportunity now to talk a bit about 
uh, table joins. So we have uh, joined data based on attributes earlier uh, in GeoPython course, but we haven't really talked about it in the lessons. Mm. And yeah, for the upcoming book that we are uh, now writing, there should be a separate section or we want to include a separate section about table joins in the course, but this is now a kind of quick recap and overview uh, to remind you about the basics of uh, joining, joining data tables together, kind of row by row. So we have some data, then there's some matching key or index, and then we uh, merge some columns together to have multiple multi multiple columns in one object uh, okay and an excellent resource for understanding table joins is uh, this pandas documentation about merge join and concatenate and there especially um, let's see i think it's still further down there was this There. So there's this section uh, that starts with database style, data frame, or named series. Uh, so in most of the cases when dealing with spatial data and then you want to join some attributes, uh, you want to either use the merge uh, command or then the join, join command. Mm, and then there we either create a left join, right join, and then you can specify if it's an inner join. So all the matching record, uh, matching rows will be in the output, mm, or then all the rows from both of them, and so on. So for understanding the specific parameters, I recommend that then you refer to this uh, pandas documentation about uh, joining, joining and merging data. Mm. In our case, we now have the geocoding results. Um, those of those of us who have it. Um, if I still check the head. Uh, and then we have the original data, uh, which look, looked like this. Uh, and the case is actually so that we do have, um, if I check len geo, and then I check len data. So we have an equal number of rows. So for each row, the geocoder returned a result. And in this case, we can kind of just glue these together based on the index values. Uh, and that uh, can be done in pandas using the join, uh, join function. So if we would take the out geocoding output, geo join, and then data, uh, so, and as we have a matching, th those uh, two data frames have a matching index, uh, we can automatically uh, combine all the data. I'll do so that I store the output in this new variable called join. Mm. And now that I joined data from the pandas data frame to the geodata frame, the output is of type uh, geodata frame. If I would have done it the other way around, then I would have a pandas uh, data frame. And that's important. Uh, I think you'll need to do this kind of thing in the exercise. So you might then be lost at some point. Are you dealing with a, a geodata frame or a pandas data frame? And then, of course, the things you can do with the geometries depend. Uh, if it is a geodata frame or not. Okay. Mm. All right. So that that was basically it. And then once we have done this joining based on index, uh, we can save the output to file. Mm, join to file out file path. And if you now didn't get the results. I'll just rerun this. You can still find this uh, addresses.shape file in the data folder. And you can maybe read it in and check it. So apologies for the uh, kind of 
Q, Q with the um, geocoding part, but I hope you understand the logic. So we use a specific provider uh, and it has some rate limiting in, in place in order to send. Uh, maybe I'll still print out this um, join.head. So the input for the geocoder was this addresses column in our text file. And then uh, the geocoder has found this uh, Ruoholahti 14 Itämerenkatu Ruoholahti Länsi Uusimaa or whatever, Länsi Helsinki. So this is then the actual address from OpenStreetMap that Nominatim has linked our address to. So that's the first place then to look for some weird things if you, for example, then were geocoding Mannerheimintie, but then you got Mannerheimintie from uh, Oulu, for example. Okay, so uh, those of you who you didn't get the geocoding results, you can maybe try it later uh, after the break or during the break, just rerun, rerun the geocoding cell. Otherwise, this was a very quick introduction uh, to geocoding. So if you have a couple of addresses, let's say your home location, or you're doing some interviews and you want to geocode the addresses of the interviewees, go ahead and use Nominatim for that. But as mentioned, it's only for kind of these occasional, occasional uh, geocoding jobs. And then there's other ways of then uh, doing geocoding with larger amounts of data. Okay, so do you have any questions other than uh, problems with getting the response? Then we have the process of reverse geocoding, so we could send the geocoder coordinates and then find the nearest address. That's also possible if you have an application like that. Okay. If there are no urgent questions, I will clear the check marks, marks acknowledging that not everybody was able to complete the tutorial, but that was expected. Uh, so we will then continue using these addresses that we geocoded in the next section.